I'd like to call the Des Moines City Council regular meeting for July 7th into session. And with that, I'm going to turn the floor over to Vic Pennington for the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you, Councilmember Pennington. With that, uh, let me let the record reflect that all seven members of the council are present. So I wanted to make a quick statement here. As we all know, several of you who viewed the meeting last, last session, I believe it was a July, June 23rd meeting, we had audible issues, audibility issues. And I just wanted to talk about those for a quick second. So first of all, we, we're back and new to the dais. So we need a little bit of forgiveness of that and on occasion. And I just want to clarify to my fellow council members, make sure your mics are on when you're speaking and speak directly. And we had a couple of issues where the mics weren't on or somebody else's were turned off, things like that. So we had problems that way. We also, of course, had Councilmember Oxker, who was uh, addressing the uh, meeting from his home due to his COVID situation, which we appreciate, by the way. But unfortunately, um, we had a computer on and phones and what to mute when and so forth caused 10 second delays and so forth on my speaker system and so forth. So there were, there were situations where our newness as a council back to the dais were the problem. And I think we've reviewed those and we understand what those issues are and we're addressing them. The other issue was there was a, there was a call out for closed captioning, particularly on channel 21. I could tell you that uh, I spoke with Bonnie Wilkins. She is uh, working with IT to address that issue and will be getting back to us of what, what, in, what that entails and what the cost might be to better serve the community. In no by means was it intentional or is our system broken. It was more about uh, what I'll cut, like to say user error. And uh, for that we apologize to the community but, and we vow to get better, but it, it is an understandable mistake. And going forward, I think tonight you're probably hearing a vast improvement in that situation. With that, are there any correspondence? Thank you, Mayor. No correspondence, but we do have some written public comment. Tina Nelson, Airplane, Na Airplane Noise Over Des Moines, Laurel Hughes, Redo the Streets, Right Away Landscaping, and Sharon Morehouse, Redondo Area Concerns. And that concludes the written public comment. Thank you, City Clerk, and congratulations on the, being the new City Clerk. Thank you. All right, with that, we'll, we'll have uh, time for uh, co public comment. I would just like to remind those participants that any person making personal, impertinent, or slanderous remarks or who become bolsterous, threatening, or personally abusive while addressing the council will be removed from the meeting. You will have three minutes to speak. And first on our list is Mr. Rick Johnson. But um, we need you to talk into the speaker. This is this should be out here, because where you guys are sitting, it's way back, and we can't hear you a lot of times. And I don't know how many times I've brought this up. Get another sound system. This isn't this isn't going to work. Or if they can get an extension on this, and maybe that'll work a little bit better. Um, I see you're going to try to get uh, the speed limit down on uh, Highway 99, the whole length of it in the city. Well, I've just coincidence that I've thought of reducing the speed limit on Redondo Beach Drive to 20 miles an hour. Parking at Vista Mar Villa, that's the very last one on the uh, north end of Redondo on the water. It, uh, it um, has a car in front of it almost daily, almost every time you go down there. And I know the, the officers have chased them out of there. I think they need to make it a one-lane road coming down 281st or 280th. And on the east, east side, have it barred, barred uh, 
stripped off or whatever, you need, need to paint it off so they can't park there and they can have, only have the one lane that leads out onto Redondo Beach Drive. Um, and correspondence, like you just mentioned here, uh, we don't get to see or hear what what their problem is, and I think that's a, I think that should be done. I think we need to know what we're talking about when people call and are writing because they can't for some reason uh, attend a meeting, just say anything uh, here. But um, anyway, uh, this correspondence I think it should be should be let known to the citizens of Des Moines. And um, in the audio again, get extension. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Mr. Johnson, just so you know that all the public comments, the correspondence, they're attached to the record after the meeting and available should you want to see the details. With that, I'm going to move on to and I hope I pronounced this right, Karen Coover? You were, you were signing in? Okay. All right, no problem. Um, Mr. Pettingbone, you would be next on the list. Did you wish to speak? Okay, you'll have three minutes, sir. Um, good afternoon, good evening. I hope that you folks are all doing well. Uh, we still live across the street from the landmark on the Sound and still curious as the Dickens as to what's going on over there. Nobody will tell us anything. We have received no valid information from any source that I'm aware of. We have no idea what the person who paid $11 million for the land intends to do with it. I'm sure that he might have I'm almost sure that he might have some really good plans to turn it into something wonderful and beautiful and historically accurate. Building that is standing there has got to be part of it if he can do it. More power to him. I think that there's always people out there who do great things. The McMinimum Brothers down in Oregon have bought up old time hotels and restored them into beautiful places with multiple usage and multiple businesses and three or four restaurants built into them. There's a huge interest in this building somewhere out in Des Moines, Washington. 33,000 people live here. 33,000 people know that big building, but none of them know what's going on. Nobody in my neighborhood knows what's going on. Nobody has been properly notified by authentic Notification, people are required to make big giant signs to put up 12 signs around a fence that's 5,000 feet long by state law, federal law. 500 feet, every 500 feet, four foot by eight foot plywood sign belongs up. It needs to be on the outside of the fence so that you can read it. It needs to be easy for people to drive by and say, wow, look at all the signs on the zenith by the land, landmark by the sound wonder what they're going to do. I wonder if there's something happening to it. I wonder if somebody bought it because there ain't anything in the newspaper. There ain't anything that you can find out. You can't find out on the Berrien blog. You can't find out from the mayor of Normandy Park, but somebody knows it. Some of you know it. Probably most of you know what he plans on doing. There's 27 acres of dirt there, and it needs to be announced to the public in what is called an official SEPA checklist. The one that we finally found is 14 pages long. It's really difficult to find it, so I advise everybody to try and go real hard, find the 14-page SEPA checklist, and then see if there's some way that we can get a nice new one, and the developer has to answer all of the questions by law. It is not a formal request from the Boy Scouts. It is a law. SEPA report checklist, go find it. Do it over, tell your SEPA officials, start over. No notification to the public has ever occurred. Thank you very much. Look forward to some kind of beautiful building coming out of this. Thank you, Mr. Pettibone. All right, with that, 
I'm going to move on to the city manager's report. Michael, I turn the floor to you. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, everyone. Um, in terms of city manager's report, we were going to provide an update on the 4th of July. Uh, Assistant Chief Richards uh, provided an update at the Public Safety and Emergency Management Committee earlier this evening, and we will um, leave it in the hands of the chair of that committee, uh, Deputy Mayor Buxton, uh, to make comments uh, during her opportunity relative to committee reports. Um, the next one, surprisingly enough, has to do with the landmark. And um, I want to uh, provide some information. There was a scoping process that was initiated. Scoping mean what would be the context of the environmental assessment, the environmental impact statement. What elements would be included in that review? So we went through that a couple of weeks ago, and I want to inform the City Council that the determination of significance and scoping comment period for the Zenith Properties Environmental Impact Statement will be re-noticed. As Council is aware, the City hired consultants to facilitate the scoping process and noticing for the Environmental Impact Statement. During scoping, the city learned that a number of people who live adjacent to the subject property did not receive a mailed notice. The city and consultant team researched the matter and determined that the radius map and address list generated for the project did not accurately capture all property owners, occupants, and tenants within 300 feet of the subject property per the Des Moines Municipal Code. Given these findings and knowing the value of this pro project to the community, we are absolutely committed to ensuring a transparent and comprehensive process for those who have an interest in the outcome of the environmental impact statement. City administration, the consultant team, and the applicant made the decision to reissue the determination of significance and scoping notice and provide an additional 30-day comment period and a second public scoping meeting. The project team is working on the final details for the noticing and that will be provided to the public um, as soon as it is available, probably early next week. One other thing, there's been a lot of um, attention to the landmark as well it should. Beautiful facility. But City Council has been advised multiple times that they sit as the quasi-judicial review board for any potential development, the landmark. And therefore, it's absolutely essential that they appear impartial and neutral to any plans presented. The landmark is now in private hands, previously owned by the Masons, who sold it to a, a developer. Okay, we're gonna be adding the additional language to the city's website, stating, Underneath the description of the landmark property, city council members have been advised by the city attorney's office not to comment on or interfere with the ongoing environmental process or the pending application in accordance with state law and city code, as well as the likelihood they will serve in a quasi-judicial role on future applications for a development proposal at the site. Okay, so city council, individually and collectively, need to retain their appearance of impartiality as they go about evaluating whether any potential development is consistent with the laws of the city. That talks about the landmark right now. I appreciate your comments, sir. Perhaps we could have a sidebar at some point. However, Moving on, um, earlier la in the last few years, we've spent quite a bit of time focused on succession planning. We've done that primarily at council, the council budget retreat as we've anticipated moving forward, how we were structuring the city to assure that we had longevity and uh, consistency of operations moving forward depending upon 
um, any changes in personnel that might occur. And I just want to say one thing that kind of the, the spark that initiated that was our police department because we were undergoing some turnover at the same time we were being exposed to some level of risk. And so we wanted to help identify how could we protect the city by maintaining continuity of operations. And one, one outcome of that was hiring of Chief Thomas, who's done an incredible job working on that. We were able to hire Assistant Chief Mark Cooey from the Washington State Patrol, who has a great deal of experience on a number of levels. And um, there were some other promotions that occurred. The Chief, additionally, has been extremely innovative in creating opportunities for his troops where they can move up through the ranks and do different types of things, do some of the innovative programs that are exciting to people. And typically, police departments had been caught in the rut where you come in as a patrol officer, you spend 20 years, everything goes well, you become a sergeant. This is not the case with Des Moines police who have created opportunities for um, line personnel or officers to advance their careers and their opportunities. Um, with that, I am going to turn it over to the chief. I just want to say one of the, the key pieces in this process has been the um, kind of promotion of uh, Assistant Chief Patty Richards. I remember, Patty, you and I probably did one of the first ride-alongs I ever did here, and you were a sergeant at that point. And you moved from there to a operations commander, and now you're moving even beyond that to assistant chief um, in the police department. And your performance has been beyond stellar, and we're grateful. So with that, I think I'll turn it over to the chief. Chief, if you have uh, comments and then a couple of other issues. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, Patty, come on up. Councilmember Pennington, if you would uh, be willing to come up also. I wanted to say a few words. Uh, Patty, uh, Assistant Chief Richards, about a year ago exactly, <clears throat> I promoted her to commander. And uh, she took over the patrol division and did an absolutely incredible job beyond all expectations uh, working uh, with our officers, who uh, she commands a lot of respect from, as well as community members uh, working on projects. And she has done such a great job that uh, I, in uh, concert with the city manager, got approval to promote her to the position of assistant chief. Uh, and that um, opens up some opportunities for other internal candidates to possibly promote up. Um, I probably won't uh, be here forever. And uh, Assistant Chief Cooey, uh, you know, we are within our last couple years, so we want to make sure that we do a really good job of leaving the department in good hands. And uh, Assistant Chief Richards has done an absolute incredible job, and she will carry that forward. So we wanted to recognize her this evening uh, with the promotion and uh, Council Member Pennington, I don't know if he wants to say a few words, uh, but has been a strong mentor uh, for many years uh, of Patty. And so he is going to have the honor of pinning her Assistant Chief's badge on. Uh, Vic, did you want to say a few words? First off, Patty, thank you. This is a, truly a, a, a privilege, a personal privilege, and, and we've been friends for, for 30 years and have worked on the street together, worked in all sorts of different areas together. Um, Patty, you, you, you have set the bar at a lot of levels, you know, from, from police officer to sergeant to commander, now to assistant chief. And I'm very proud of you. I'm personally honored that, that I was asked to, to pin your badge.
well, it's a police badge, and the fire guys can't figure that out very well, but we're, we're working on it. Thank you. My only thing I would like to say is Des Moines is lucky with the team they have. You, we have some incredible sergeants, incredible officers, an amazing chief, and I think you're really going to be excited. I have challenged sergeants and officers. I want us to be, and it's been for a long time in our wording, but I want us to be the premier law enforcement agency in the valley and the state. And even as recently as today, I had somebody take that challenge on and he's willing to move forward and he's uh, been frustrated and he's excited that we want to go to that next level. And it's part of your leadership as well as the city. We need to represent everybody to the best of our ability. But thank you. Chief, I was waiting for you to get that shot in. <laughs> well, uh, Vic served that up for me, so. Okay, and then the next uh, topic that I have, and we discussed this uh, at the uh, Public Safety Emergency Management meeting earlier today. <clears throat> we have an excellent opportunity uh, as a police department and a community um, I am going to introduce uh, a person in a second, but first I want to introduce the program that we were contacted uh, just recently uh, by the Public Defenders Association. Uh, there is some money available uh, that is being offered to our community uh, to work uh, with the LEAD program, Law Enforcement Assisted Diversion, and this is a new one for me, so I'm going to get it right. Let everyone advance with dignity. That's, that's the new part. So um, we have an opportunity to get some funding for this program um, through the end of this year and hopefully into the next year, and, and basically... This is a program where it fits perfectly with our strategy, with our GPS, getting people services workers, where we're engaging with people with mental health, drug addiction, and homeless issues, and we're trying to get them into services. Well, the LEAD program is the services that we're trying to get these people that need assistance into so we can help the community. And we don't have to wait till they commit a crime, but if they do commit a minor crime, instead of putting them into the criminal justice system, we can divert them into uh, treatment and services programs uh, to help them and to help our community. So it fits perfectly with our strategy. The timing is tight because um, we were offered this funding uh, the city has no uh, funding um, liability at this time. So we want to use as much of that funding as available. So our hope is we brought it to the uh, Public Safety Committee today. We're going to give a presentation um, now. And then hopefully by uh, next week's meeting, we can uh, vote on an MOU to start this program and really get people going into services. So I'm now going to introduce Lisa Dugard, and Lisa's going to come up and uh, give a short presentation on the LEAD program. And, and just as a matter of introduction, if you don't know Lisa or haven't recognized uh, her name uh, in criminal justice type issues, uh, she is absolutely um, amazing. I have a ton of respect for the work that she's done, and she's probably been responsible for some of the most significant work 
on what you would traditionally think was on the opposite side of law enforcement. However, she's probably the most reasonable person that uh, I've ever dealt with in these areas because she's willing to have the discussion and to have the conversation. So I just have a ton of respect uh, for Lisa and the work that she's done for many, many years. And uh, so Lisa, if you would come up and give a presentation, thank you. Thank you so much, um, Chief. I, being called reasonable by Chief Ken Thomas is a true honor and something that I will carry with me for a long time. Also want to congratulate Assistant Chief Richards, who um, this is really um, special to get to see that. Uh, I don't know how to advance this. Oh, yes, OK. It's going to work. This is really short. Um, let me just uh, first do sort of set the um, the context about the opportunity. We have some funding that's a few years old um, from the King County Mid Fund to offer the lead model to um, communities that are interested in pursuing it in South King County. And the communities that have done that to date are Burien and Unincorporated North Highline. So sort of you're adjacent to the North communities. And this uh, last couple of years has been really challenging, um, as you might imagine, as it has been for everybody in all sectors. Um, in our world, there was a ton of change and you know serious workforce challenges um, in social work. So it's been uh, it's been tough. But um, Burien Lead and North Highline Lead have come through it in pretty good uh, in pretty good shape. We have some underspend from that uh, two-year appropriation that ends in December of 2022. So consistent with the original purpose of those funds, offering them to uh, another zone or community in Southwest King County is in keeping with the original charge that we had. One of the hallmarks of LEAD is that we would never you know, try to embark on this um, without a willing partnership um, in community, and in particular, law enforcement leadership is critical. I'm uh, going to second what Assistant Chief Richard said about how incredibly, and what several of you said about um, how incredibly fortunate this community has to have the leadership of Chief Thomas, who really is um, a visionary and innovative thinker, and um, you know, basically leaders common sense that uh, we want to do more to respond to the dire conditions that some people are living in related to substance use, other behavioral health conditions, mental illness, and um, extreme poverty. Sometimes people with those conditions commit crimes that need to be responded to, but the res everyone knows that the response is not going to be accomplished through a trip through the criminal legal system, um, certainly not exclusively. There needs to be more. But that more needs to be coordinated with police response. And um, officers need to know what the plan is. And community leaders need to know what the plan is so that that can be reinforced. And then you know it can carry on as long as it takes in order to actually resolve the issue. So um, we are, if Des Moines wants to move forward with this opportunity this year, number one, my office, which is the project management team for lead in um, King County communities that have a lead program, are prepared to stand shoulder to shoulder with you in seeking continuation funding, whether that is from King County, um, and I'm not privy to the revenue projections. I don't know how that situation is looking, but there are also federal and state funding opportunities that fit this very well. So we are, and you know, those funds have been, the federal funds have been received by the Puyallup Tribe, the Macaw Tribe, Whatcom County, Snohomish, um, Mason, actually, I guess Mason is only state funded. But the, the point is there are good strategies for continuing on if we have a solid foundation for the rest of this year and if it's been a good experience for your community. And so we're just proposing to give it a try as, at a demonstration level. Really quickly here on the um, model. Uh, so LEAD is born of the you know, common recognition that we have problems that police have been asked to solve alone and they need partners um, and they need resources beyond whatever could be uh, mobilized through a police department, yet police are asked to respond to law violations and we need to work together in order to have a more effective response. Um, the, yeah, 
I'm not just repeat myself. There are three ways into um, lead case management, but regardless of what the front door is, the back door looks the same, which is sustained care um, for people with behavioral health conditions who commit, who chronically commit crimes or have problematic activity until the situation gets better. So it's not time limited. We basically keep trying until things get better. And as you may know from your own personal experience with loved ones or <laughs> Community members, um, you know, sometimes recovery from behavioral health conditions is very, you know, it's a long arc of change, and so we stick with it until we find a way forward um, that is effective. So arrest diversion, like Chief Thomas said, if um, the police department has legal authority to make an arrest, but recognizes that that's probably not going to get at the underlying issue, they can call. Um, a 24-7 response line and have a warm handoff, immediate response, a case manager who comes out into the field. And this is where the GPS workers would be, you know, like harmonized with this. We wouldn't try to duplicate what you're already doing. We would build onto that architecture in a way that is efficient um, and cost effective. Second, um, wait, oh, so, so that would be, you know, there's grounds for arrest, but the officer makes an intentional choice to divert to care if the, um, individual signs a release of information that allows us to coordinate with police on an ongoing basis and with prosecutors and they complete an in-depth psychosocial interview, then that low-level case is diverted and not filed. And in return, we have a lot more information to work with and a lot better coordination. The second way in is through social contact uh, referral from police. This is where there's not currently probable cause to make an arrest, but the officer knows and the department knows that this person is chronically in a situation where they could or they do commit law violations um, and you want to be proactive and prevent crime. Um, so going upstream, you can make that uh, referral even without uh, grounds for an arrest. And the third is a community referral. We all know, um, you know, at all law enforcement departments are stretched. Um, and so if you don't need to call police and you can directly call for uh, a response without having to impose additional workload on the department, that's also great and the model is built um, to respond to that as well. Um, we have estimated in informal conversations that there's like a starting pool of people in the Des Moines community of about 25 to 30 um, obvious referrals uh, sort of on day one. I wanted to let um, the chief and assistant chief know that the potential case management agencies actually already done outreach to the location that you identified and counted 25 people. So I think you were right on the money there. Um, the, and I should mention that the, um, we are very, in terms of moving quickly and taking advantage of this potential funding opportunity, the multi-service center um, that is you know, located here in Southwest King County, proposed to do similar work in a recent public procurement um, for the county was deemed a qualified bidder, was not selected because they wanted to focus in Algona, Des Moines, and um, Federal Way only and not a sort of wider swath of territory. So they're really well situated to do this work and the work would be led by somebody who's an experienced lead case manager and indeed uh, helped found the program a decade ago. There's been quite a lot of research on lead efficacy and um, basically this is a good thing to try because people do better than they would have otherwise. That doesn't mean that we're not constantly looking for additional resources so that, you know, we don't, we're not a housing program. We don't have set-asides in housing and if we did, people would do better. We don't have, you know, immediate access to set-aside treatment beds and if we did, people would do better. But just with case management and coordination, people do have a significantly lesser likelihood of reoffense um, and do better with income, shelter, and um, public benefits. This is our team for immediate contact if you wanted to follow up for any reason. Um, and uh, we are, with, with your green light, if you decide that you want to give this a try, we, our next step would be to confirm that to King County and get their approval to contract with Multi-Service Center and get started. Thanks so much. Really great to be here. Okay. I don't know if I should exit here. Someone can. You can get us out of here. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Thank. We can. Um, thank you. I think one of the things that um, this is part of a larger strategy and it's involved our police chief and others, um, but especially working with our legislators 
on ways to try and find resources so that we could allow the police to um, focus their attentions on police-related matters specifically. And when it involves some type of intervention or social services or access to resources, that there may be other pathways, for example this, as a way to get there. And not only does that accomplish better outcomes for the people in need, it also creates better outcomes for our community who can experience more law enforcement as a result of the diversion process. So we thank you. If council, are there any questions, comments? This would be a great time. Councilmember Nutting. I just have one quick question. On slide three, the um, three um, ways to deal with um, things, it was mentioned that there's possibly on the uh, community referral, um, there's a 24 7 hotline. So if you see somebody in crisis, clearly in crisis, in the middle of an intersection that is having whatever issue they are, instead of burdening the um, department with that, they're, they're, we could call the multi-service line and, and they could deal with that situation. That, that's the long-term vision of this model is that that 24-7 response would be equally available to community initiated calls as to police. Right now the scaling, the funding and the scaling is not at the level that we can have sort of a, a person sitting by the phone all night to the, the, as you can imagine, the volume of community referrals would be potentially higher. There's so many people who potentially fall within the, you know, the, the qualifications to get services that a lot of people might call. Um, so the 24 seven response is presently limited to police, uh, to responding to police calls. That's not the best way if you were gonna, you know, if money was no object, um, that's not the best way to design the system. You're absolutely right. It'd be, and that's what people wanna do. They wanna call somebody to come and help and everybody knows that forcing that call to go through the police department is not, doesn't necessarily make sense in a lot of cases and it's not the best use of their time. So we're absolutely, you know, looking to re redesign the flow so that the community referrals can be immediate response and 24 seven. If we keep going with this, I think we should build a budget that would allow for that. Absolutely, uh, um, I just thank you for the presentation and look forward to see the uh, uh, agenda, agenda item next week. Thank you. Thank you. Deputy Mayor Buxton. Kind of connected to the last question, is there going to be uh, is there going to be a coordination with the new 988 in regard to the services that this provides? The architecture of 988 and criminal legal system response is such an interesting question. Um, nationally and in Washington State, there's not been a lot of attention yet about how these pieces fit together. Um, 988 is not built for response to crime, and that's where that's the gap that lead fills. Is that um, you know public expectations about law violations are a little bit different than people who are understood to be in crisis, but they're not violating the law. So, um, and yet 988 is often going to get calls where lead services would be the right response. So, seeing 988 make referrals into lead makes sense, and. Um, there are times when our inability to make an immediate response in the middle of the night without police involved is a barrier, but 988 might be able to mobilize better funded resources. So putting these pieces together locally is a high priority. Those discussions are happening and there are two statewide committees, one focused on the 988 build out as I'm sure you know, and the other is um, this committee called SURSAC, the Substance Use Recovery Services Advisory Committee, and they're sort of converging on how to fit these um, components together. I expect that that'll be uh, part of the report to the legislature at the end of the year. But locally, we can figure that out, you know, kind of uh, on the ground. And I, I expect there will be cross-cutting referrals. Yeah, great question. Council Member Harris. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so so uh, you mentioned, you used the word harmonized. And uh, d does that, you're, you know, does that mean that um, you're providing money for our programs? You're not providing the programs per se, but we develop the programs and you provide the funding to make it happen and the case management 
to make sure that the person connects with them. Am I oversimplifying? <clears throat> My understanding is that um, GPS is a locally funded venture, or it's your program anyway. I'm actually not, I don't know where the, where the funds come from. Apologies for that. And we would be bringing additional workers who would be housed at multi-service center, but who would have a division of labor with GPS so that there was a seamless flow, uh, sort of seamless workflow. I imagine that GPS workers would initiate quite a few referrals. Chief Thomas saying refer to services, well, where are those services? And LEAD can provide long-term case management for people for whom that's the right answer. It's not gonna be everybody, but for whom, for those for whom it is the right answer, we can provide that. From our perspective, so LEAD is what's called a collective impact model. It means that no one entity owns it. It's collectively <laughs> owned by the city of Des Moines, uh, community leaders, King County that's providing the funding, and decisions are made by consensus sort of governing decisions. So in a very real sense, each LEAD program is your program. You, you know, nothing can happen without your agreement, and if you don't want it, it ends. So, um, but it would be, but the funding would add to the resources that are currently available in the community. And the only entity that we have identified that's able to immediately do this work is multi-service center. So our proposal is kind of a package that it would be multi-service center doing that demonstration project. Uh, thank, thank you. Um, and uh, have you been involved with Burien's program for quite yes. some? Okay, great. Because I, I first ran across it several years ago. And um, do they now have any kind of you know longitudinal kind of uh, things we could look at as far as um, you know outcomes and that sort of thing? So King County looked. Uh, King County tracked from the from day one of Burien um, all referrals and a whole variety of system outcomes. The problem is, so yeah, I mean, I can tell you yes, and there's a report. Well, stipulated that but, their program is going to be unique to their right. Thing. Here's the challenge: is that um, normal the the normal way that we would look at. Um, outcomes in the criminal legal system is that you would see if people who participated in the program were being arrested less frequently, were um, going to jail less frequently, and so on. The last two years, everyone went to jail less frequently, Does that whether they were committing crimes or not. And it, for many people, they were committing more crimes and they were going to jail less frequently because jail booking was so restricted, police response was so restricted. Does that make sense? So the, the normal... Um, that the baseline and then the impact of these kinds of interventions have really been challenging for evaluators to look like. So I am sure that the King County data shows that people in Burien didn't go to jail. I think the question is, what were they doing while they weren't going to jail? And I think that the Burien Police Department's experience is probably the best, um, you know, the best substitute that we have. They have um, been an amazing partner and they have reported that this fills their, you know, there are people that they're not gonna book into jail that need daily contact and they need information, and the police need information about what's going on with them so they can make discretionary decisions and we're, and that's been a wonderful partnership, I think. No, 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 super cool. I was just hoping there was like a web page with a spreadsheet that said. There is, I think that, I think those data do exist on the, and I will send you as follow up before your next meeting, where King County reports on these mid investments, because they are analyzed in terms of jail admissions and so on. I'm just saying, we could have been doing nothing and people would have gone to jail less over the last two years just because, and I just don't want to, sell you snake oil or pretend that that no, means anything? No, you're not really overselling doesn't. at all. I'm just, you know, just looking for a spreadsheet. That's not yep. that's all. But can, thank you so much. Really. Yeah, absolutely. And I will send you those links. All right, Councilmember Steinmetz. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm really glad to see you here. I'm, I'm a former criminal defense attorney and was a Washington Defender Association very reasonable member as well. <laughs> for, for many, many years. So I think this is a great use of, of the organization. Uh, to do that. A lot of the diversion programs that have uh, been developed, you know, in the last 20 years or so have ended up being pretty cookie cutter. Yeah. Um, you've got a six month or a eight, 12 month or even an 18 month program that you have to go through. And then you're kind of out on your own. I think I heard you say that this was not going, this was going to be open ended. Uh, and I think that's wonderful because this is what a lot of people need. They need 
there are stages in this process of recovery, um, stages in the process of learning to deal with mental health issues, and the need doesn't go away. It doesn't just disappear. Yeah. So, uh, no, exactly. Mm -hmm. Many of the resources that hinge on involvement in the criminal legal system, uh, eligibility for them ends when the case is over. And that very rarely maps onto someone's arc of recovery and stabilization. So it's not time limited. We stick with people as long as they need it. And one of the and rarely has that been tried. What we've seen is that um, you know the original cohort that entered lead back in 2012. It took a lot of those people four years to start doing what you would recognize as um, standard drug treatment. They were working on other things before then and got sort of getting their feet under them. And then we had a big wave of people who entered um, inpatient treatment four years into the program. And nobody really plays that out to see what's going to happen if we really stick with people. Our commitment is to, to do the very best, to have the best outcome that is possible given what's happened in somebody's life, the point at which we intersect with them, the resources that we have, um, and the resources that they can access. And things just do turn out better than they would have otherwise. I want to underscore that we know we could do a lot better for the community and for the individual if we had access to things like housing and uh, um, you know, a lawful income stream for people. And as we go into recessionary economic conditions, that's going to become more and more of an issue. So we're going to continue to fight for the, the resources that will allow outcomes to be you know, more rapidly stronger and better. But this is the best we can do with where we are, and you deserve to, to do that, you know, and, and we're here to, to make that happen. We all learn lessons as we implement this, and, you know, lead is a continuous evolution process, a continuous improvement model, and we'll be real honest with you about where we see system gaps. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Pennington. Thank you for your presentation. Um, just a, a couple of quick questions. On the funding, it's if I understand it, it's funding uh, through from King County yep. through the multi-service center, and programs are accessed either programs that we've put together or programs that you have developed, or multi-service center has developed. The the program is lead case management, so that is um, assigning a case manager to an average of twenty. Um, 20 people to work with and an, an outreach component so that they're not sitting in an office waiting for people to come to them, they're going out. That is the social service component of LEAD and that would be new and it would be paid for um, with these funds. I want to so King County would not contract directly with Multi-Service Center. We hold, we are, PDA is the project manager and we hold the funds and we subcontract for case management. So we would simply quickly execute a contract with MSC if King County approves. Okay, and so um, going forward, uh, presuming council approves this, and and we're in the last six months of the funding cycle, as I understand. So going forward into the future, do we have to reapply and and, and create another MOU? And, and so we have to so we. You wouldn't have to create a new MOU. We would we would already have the container, and we would just seek continuation funding either from. You know, if the mid can continue to support us at this level, we'll see how much how much lead we can buy with that. Um, I don't take any of that for granted. So you know, the next couple of months will be an important time of seeing if there's going to be continued support by the county for this. You know, for Burien, for North Highline, um, as well as any any new uh, location. And there are clearly state funding um, streams that are developing for work of this nature. And so I think. One way or the other, there's a really good chance and there's no guarantee that we could continue. And having good community experiences that we can tell the legislature about will be really valuable and important. All right, thank you. Thank you. Mayor, please. Deputy Mayor Buxton. Uh, just to clarify also, I think um, I think I understood you to say that our, our department, our police department will not bear the burden of writing those grants that as the project manager, that's included in the funding that you you would do that for us. Yes, correct. That's correct. Absolutely. Uh, thank you. It's our job to make it possible to continue, and so far we've been successful. But you know, this is a strange and difficult time. So no no promises, but we'll do everything we can if you if you want to continue. Councilmember Harris. 
Thank you, Mayor. Um, yeah, that word sustained. I'm thinking about pals of mine that, you know, have gone through their sixth, you know, 30-day program and so on. <laughs> um, how long has this been funded, uh, you know, the program in general? How since, um, since October 2011. So we have been able to sustain steadily increasing funding since then. Okay. Well, I mean, you know, nothing but certain in life, but basically there seems to, you know, this is turning into an ongoing concern. Yes, absolutely. The reason for that is that it's intentionally built to actually respond to problems that a wide swath of the community prioritizes and to work in conjunction with all of the other players who are asked to respond to them. So, you know, the coordination with police, th there's no lead would have died a long time ago without um, police, you know, sort of endorsement and understanding how to use it and, and championing the model and so on. So it's not an accident that funding has been sustained and it hasn't been easy and it's, but it, we have always been able to maintain and increase the investment. Yeah, no, I'm just, you know, I think about people apply for grants and they don't, it's like you've got three years and then, you know, and so you have to think, is it really going to be this, because yeah. this only works if it's forever, basically. Right. Yeah. I know um, people make this joke a lot, but this, I did not used to have gray hair and what you're describing is why it looks like it does now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. City Manager Matthias. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think one thing, just to represent, and council could make its own, will make its own decision relative to this, but essentially versus kind of the old model, which is sort of your cut and dried, here's a grant resource, here's the application, here's the reward for that, here's the problem of continuing it, all those types of things are what I would call old school. And our approach, and I, I hope council would embrace this, but I've seen them do it on a number of occasions, would be to have a much more organic process where we work closely with you to come up with strategies, be they political, be they whatever, financial, whatever needs to happen, to continue the, the, the process as a partnership and not have it be subject to, oh, turn off the spigot, now we're screwed. You know, probably not the best language for the meeting. Sorry, <laughs> but um, but the idea being the idea being that we would want to be interactive with you and being successful in a, both acquiring the resources and the utilization of those resources, and that's something I think that Chief Thomas has brought to this with his contacts at WASPIC and his knowledge of this process. And we have people on staff that are very talented at writing grants, and so those would be the kind of resources we would want to bring to the table to assist you being successful and helping us be successful. So. That, that's wonderful to hear. That's the model as it's meant to operate, and uh, that's the collective impact that I was referring to. That's what the city of Burien did in order to um, increase, actually, the resources that they had available to do this work even during the pandemic, and so uh, that's absolutely um, a practice that we welcome and, and are used to. That'd be great. Thank, thank you very much. I, we're very impressed with the presentation. We appreciate it. It's been great to be here. Thank you so much. Look forward to seeing you again. Thank you, Chief. Thank you very much. Just one more item on the city manager's report. Um, I won't do this justice, but um, we do want to acknowledge longevity in our staff. And we have some just incredible people. And I always say it's pleasure for me to wake up in the morning and come to work with everyone. And um, one person in particular, I think, continues to contribute to the well-being and health and advancement of this city in just an extraordinary manner. I see it every day. I'm always impressed. And so, Mayor, would you uh, give our 15-year pin to Mr. Dan Brewer? Doesn't he have to come up here? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah.
just had to stop the bleed here, and he said, good as I can get down on one leg. God bless you. Have a good day. Thank you so much for all your service. Once again, uh, Michael embarrasses me. He loves doing that. Um, anyway, no, uh, it's a great place to work. We have a great staff, as you've heard uh, the rest uh, from others tonight. Um, and there's great things coming uh, for the city, and look forward to being a part of that. So thank you. Mayor, that concludes the manager's report. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Michael. With that, just I'm gonna I'm gonna break uh, protocol for a quick second because I believe somebody had intended to sign up to speak. Uh, Miss Morehouse, did you intend to sign up to speak, or was that a mistake? We usually have the list here signed, and that's usually what we do. But I wasn't sure if you had the indication. I wanted to afford you the opportunity if you missed that because you'd sent us an email kind of indicating you might or might not. So would you like to or? Okay, then I'll give you the floor for three minutes. So I really wasn't prepared for this, but okay, I'll just swing it. Um, I live in Des Moines, in Woodmont, and I spend a lot of time in Redondo. I walk there frequently and have for about 15 years. and. Um, I and many of my friends and neighbors are real concerned about the lack of um, law enforcement there. Um, and signage, uh, the, the, in particular the sign that has, it's been there for years but you can't even read it. I believe I sent a picture, did you all get it? That's appalling. Um, and. I would like, and many of my neighbors um, here today um, in Redondo are just, we're frightened. It's, the, it's out of control. It's completely out of control down there. Um, we have people peeing and pooping on private property, trespassing. They come clear down to Woodmont. It's about a mile down, down the beach. They're aggressive. They're argumentative. They're not nice at all. Um, I'm just hoping that our chief police are, hi there, um, we can um, do better. Anybody have any thoughts on that? This, is for, your, this is for your comments only. I just comment only. Okay, well, it's my first appearance. Um, so yes, um, I, I, I'm very excited about this new program. Um, that I think that could be very helpful, but also I think there's a lot of people down there that do not have mental health issues. They just have law enforcement um, aggressive attitudes. They're racing. They're going. They're shoot down and go around a blind corner and up a, unway, a one way, the wrong way street. It's frightening. Um, so hope. Hopefully we're going to get some help there. They're parking in front of the no parking signs, in, and they don't get tickets. Can somebody tow them away? Can we do anything different? I'm hoping that um, we can. I think we would, we could, and we should. Is, that, is my three minutes up? Oh, I have a little clock. I didn't even notice it. So yes. I'm, I'm hopeful. I, I, I'm fearful when going. People are smoking marijuana all day, every day. I can't go down there without s smelling that stench. Okay, I'm done. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Morehouse. I will, I will add this, though. Um, I will respond to you as, from the council as presiding officers. This is a national problem, and, and, the, and a lot of the... Uh, laws and so forth that uh, we're dealing with at the that at the state level and et cetera, and I'll call the handcuffing of some of our police is problematic. I can assure you the chief on many occasions has this as one of his focal spots like we have all over town. So 
So he will do his best to address it, but it's a problem bigger than just all of us, but we want to solve it all together. So thank you for your time. With that, I'm going to move over to the consent agenda with the deputy, or I'm sorry, the new city clerk, please read the consent agenda. Item one, approval of vouchers. And that concludes the consent calendar, Mayor. Is there anyone that wishes to pull, or I'm sorry, go ahead, um, Council Member Nutting. I move to approve the consent calendar as read. Second. I have Council Member Pennington uh, seconding with a close second for that for with Council Member Steinmetz. Is there anyone that wishes to approve or uh, pull this item? Seeing none, we'll take a vote. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. The vote passes 7-0, as should be for a consent agenda. All right, thank you. Moving on to new business, the first order of business is going to be the reduction of speed limits on the Pack Highway South um, with a presentation from Andrew Mer Merges. Go ahead, sir. All right, good evening, Mayor and City Council. My name is Andrew Merges, the Public Works Director for the City. This evening, I would like to provide a brief presentation for the speed reduction proposal on SR99 or Pacific Highway South. A little bit of background, the existing conditions out there, uh, SR99 is the largest principal arterial in the city. It's a four lane roadway with medians, signalized intersections and a pedestrian crossing signal. Within the city limits, it's 45 miles per hour posted in the city of SeaTac to the north of 216th. It is 40 miles per hour, and to the south of Kent Des Moines Road, it is posted at 45 miles per hour. This year, the city staff conducted a speed study back in January 2022 uh, based on traffic and safety concerns, coordination with SeaTac and Kent, as well as coordination with WashDOT. So how are speed limits determined? First, in the case of SR99, which is a state highway, WashDOT has authority uh, to approve speed limits set by the city of Des Moines. Second, national standards are followed. Speed limits are set at five mile per hour increments. It's, they're set at five miles per hour within what we call a 85th percentile speed, which is an engineering uh, metric. And what that is, it covers speeds at or below 85% of all vehicles traveling under free flowing conditions. So it's a national standard. We use an engineering standard that we use uh, quite often for a lot of elements, including speed limits. And then the last thing we look at is roadside development and roadway characteristics for setting speed limits. Uh, other factors we looked at, look at are road geometry, pace speeds, roadside development, pedestrian activity, as well as crash experience on the corridor. And from our speed study, uh, it supports a speed limit reduction from 45 miles per hour to 40 miles per hour. Uh, Interagency coordination, uh, WashDOT is focusing on the entire SR99 corridor from Tukwila to Federal Way, ultimately trying to get to a 40 mile per hour speed limit. And currently Kent is completing a speed limit change to 40 miles per hour in the next few months from KDM to South 240th. So other agencies even to the south of us are making inter, uh, incremental progress with WashDOT. So in conclusion, uh, it's recommended that the speed limit on SR99 is set to 40 miles per hour. And as noted in the packet, WashDOT has provided their concurrence in doing that. And that concludes my presentation. I put the two motions on the screen for ease of reading. And if there's any questions, I'll happy to take those. Councilor Nutting. Motion right now. Okay, I move to suspend rule 26A in order to enact draft ordinance number 22-005 on first reading. Do I have a second? I'll second the motion. With that, I open the floor up to questions and conversation. Council Member Steinmetz, you are first. I, I'm, in, I'm in clear. Is this only as to waiving Rule 26A? This is, only, this is the discussion of waiving Rule 26A as the motion. Uh, and then we, but, yeah. but if, you, if you go into the other one a little bit in part of your reasoning and discussion, it's allowed. Um, my, my question is pretty simple. Is what is the urgency that would require us to do this tonight as opposed to doing this on a second reading? 
Uh, in general, I think that with the wash dot uh, approval required for the speed limit reduction, uh, the city kind of is bound to the, the state decision. So we're just trying to implement it as fast as we can with being in front of Kent, uh, et cetera, as they move forward as well. So it took us quite a while to get here, and wash dot has dr drugged their feet for quite a few years on us on this one. Is it a funding issue or? Nope, just an implementation issue. Implementation. Yep. We've been waiting to do this for quite a while, so just mm -hmm. jumping on it as fast as we can. Okay, thank you. Councilmember Oxiger. Yes, uh, so Kent is going to do this in very short order within the next two months? They are completing their speed study and they are working with WASHTAC to get their concurrence as well. So I anticipate in the next couple of months, Kent will be doing their uh, segment south of KDM. Okay. My concern would be that we're talking about a approximately 16 to 18 block area that's within the, the city limits of uh, Des Moines, but then south of Kent Des Moines uh, Road all the way down to 272nd, that's in the, the entire uh, Pack Highway is within the jurisdiction of Kent. So I'm concerned that we're doing this piecemeal. It would seem that if we could coordinate and just say, okay, wait a minute, this entire stretch is going to be done at once. Otherwise, I think people are going to be uh, confused by the whole thing. So if we're, we're talking about just a short delay, is I think it goes to uh, Councilmember Steinman's uh, question is, is is it simply a convenience or is there an emergency that we need to do this immediately? I think the speed limit reduction is, is warranted and it's kind of like from uh, looking at it from SeaTac into Des Moines, there's a speed limit change with SeaTac being 40 and Des Moines being 45. So I don't think that, that trying to be consistent and have the whole corridor go at once, I don't know how valuable that is to wait on that. So I, I do think there's operational uh, benefit for doing this now. I think there's safety benefit for doing it now uh, versus trying to wait for other agencies to go through their own process. Councilmember Harris. So since, see you <clears throat> since we are, you know, uh, heading into something about rules, um, it, <laughs> you know, it, it would be great if... Uh, Basically, we could keep that, uh, you know, 26B or whatever, um, you know, off the agenda um, <laughs> whenever possible. It should, it, it, it should be the case that, that having that motion there is sort of like having the checkbox be defaulted, you know. It encourages speed, um, and um, it shouldn't be there unless there's a true deadline, a true emergency, because it creates the wrong behavioral economic incentive. And that's it. Deputy Mayor Buxton. Uh, I, since we do have 26A and I don't see it as an emergency, I'm, I'm not going to be in favor of uh, 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 suspending it since there's already a, there is already a difference between SeaTac uh, uh, and Des Moines and we'll move it further down the road, but they're still going to be to uh, uh, Councilmember Oxiger's point. One way or the other, you're still going to have two jurisdictions in a short period of time with the change until the whole thing is evened out. Um, I, I think it's more important at this point to honor the rule until the rule doesn't exist or we augment the rule. So just for the sake of process. Thank you. So, Andrew, I have a couple questions. So, if we were to pass this tonight, how soon is that? How soon are the signs up? The ordinance takes effect five in five days. So we'll be implementing, if approved, on Monday. So, the only thing I would say here is that by passing this, we've made in seven days difference save somebody's life because cars traveled at a slower speed during that window of time. That's, that's all I'm going to call out in this particular case. Uh, is there any more discussion before I take a vote? Um, Council Member Nutting. I, I just have to agree with you. Um, that's why I made the motion to suspend the, suspend the rule. Um, 
implementing this sooner rather than later, especially going into the summer months. Um, I see no issue with that, and I can't imagine um, if there's a citizen that would want the speed limit to remain the same or go higher um, to create a safety corridor. I, I just think it's a no-brainer. Thank you. Seeing no further discussion, I'll go ahead and take a vote. All those in favor of the motion to, to suspend Rule 26A, uh, raise your right hand. I see Councilmember Nutting, Councilmember Pennington, and myself. All those opposed? I see Councilmember Harris, Councilmember Steinmetz, Deputy Mayor Buxton, and Councilmember Oxiger. The motion pass, or fails 3-4. Therefore, the second motion would be uh, remanded to the next meeting. Is, am I correct, Matt? Uh, that is correct. The uh, the customary motion would be to uh, pass it to a second reading at the next uh, available meeting. So do I have a motion? Go, Council Member Steinmetz. Okay. So move. Pass it to the second reading. Okay. Do I have a second? Seeing Council Member Harris. So the motion is to pass it to a second reading on July 14th. Is that correct? That would be our next meeting. Okay, any discussion before I take the vote? S seeing none, all those in favor of moving it to a second reading on July 14th council meeting, raise your right hand. Vote passes 7-0. <clears throat> all right, the next order of business is the city council rule updates. Now, I, I want to remind folks, or the council, that in this particular case, I'm going to yield the floor to Deputy Mayor Buxton in a second here, but the primary focus of this, this new business isn't to discuss the new council rules. It's to discuss what the process is going to be for, that council, for the council's rules and how we plan on going about changing them and setting a timeline. With that, I yield the floor to Deputy Mayor Buxton. Thank you, Mayor. So this evening, I'm going to be making a motion. Uh, what I want to say before I make that motion is that I, I do believe that rules and laws do not change our character, no matter what society or time we've ever lived in. In fact, um, the piling on of rules and laws kind of stands as a testimony against our ability to act well and to love well without them. But, but when they're needed, they're needed. So um, in regard to our rules of procedure, municipal rules of procedure uh, don't necessarily provide significant consequences, but they can inspire us, they warn us, they can teach us about good and ethical government. When used well, they guide the council, the staff, and the public in communication, interaction, and expectations. So currently, we do have council rules of procedure. They're becoming, in, in my opinion, outdated in both language and form. Uh, there's a need for clarity regarding roles and responsibilities of the council, the staff, and the public. There's a need for clarity regarding process. Uh, there's a desire to substantiate updates as essential, valuable, and valid using a, pro using a professional. So with that in mind, I'm going to make the motion. I move that the council authorize a comprehensive revision of the council rules, including the formation of an ad hoc committee of the council for this purpose, as well as the contracting of a professional consultant for the process. Second. Was that a second for you as well? OK. Yes. Um, I would just um, like to make a friendly amendment to that. I would like to um, add a, a potential timeline to that, that we, that the goal is to have a council meeting to review the results and have a council, council rule review in the, sometime in the month of November as a target date. I would accept that friendly amendment. And the second would agree? As well. Okay. Opening the, opening the floor for discussion. Councilmember Harris, and, excuse me, Councilmember Harris. Before I let you start, and I to re to remind everybody, if we get into the particulars of the council rules and changes, I will stop you. It's solely about the process. Thank you, Councilmember Harris. You may have the floor. 
Um, thank you. I, I'm just I'm trying to understand your pro the the proposal is to hire a a, a consultant before we even discuss like potential rule changes or I mean what's the flow or do you have that so, in mind so I can I can answer that from from where my take is but I'll let my fellow council members respond on theirs is that the idea is that all of us are aware of that there there's a need for council rule changes the idea is that all of us would have the ability to submit those changes but with an ad hoc committee and the help of a consultant who has and, and we know that there's they're out there that could help and guide us and even bring in uh, where we have certain certain situations they could bring in what other cities have done and things like that and maybe the language and so forth it's to help us be able to take all those thoughts put them in the right buckets formulate the new council rules in what would be as updated as we would know it to be um, so it's more of the consultant would be the help or assistance in this regard and be kind of the collective um, the collection I guess vessel for for our input and so forth do I have that described uh, deputy mayor Buxton correct and and again uh, I I believe that the contracting of a professional will help alleviate I think a lot of tedium and discussion because I feel like they could either validate or invalidate some of our desires with their experience they could say you know nobody does it this way and this is why or you might consider doing it this way and this is why and uh, hopefully also with the background of um, uh, support through MRSC or other professional organizations that could give some good input thank you Councilmember Steinmetz. Yeah, just a, just a couple of questions. Um, will all council members be able to give written comments, even if they're not on the ad hoc committee, for rule changes that they would like to see? As as I see it, and I think, of course, this is only my. I'm only one of seven. I think, with, by passing this, we're all in agreement that everybody, every council member, would be able to submit whatever council member or council rule recommended changes that they choose. Would there be any incremental steps by which all council members uh, could see, say, the work in a certain uh, in a certain bucket? I, I think, uh, yeah, yeah. Give him give feedback. I think, in all honesty, that's a little difficult. I think there's going to be a lot of sections that have to be reviewed. I think the meeting process for the council rules is probably going to be two or three meetings. Once the process begins, they'll probably be contentious and they'll probably be long. I think that's when the, uh, the material will be covered. The idea here is for this ad hoc committee to get it boiled down, to be able to put the options in the sections, and then put it before us in an educated, constructive, organized manner. Um, I would say that I don't see it being steps along the way, um, because I think when we get to the steps for each section, I do believe that's when it needs to be the full council, it needs to be a a study session type of, of environment where we go over the sections, we have the discussion and so forth. But everybody would know what their input was and, and so forth and the discussion would happen at that point. But it's more to consolidate it and get it ready. Um, many of us who've worked on it, um, many of us who've worked on it or looked at it before realize that it is comprehensive and is extensive. So it's more like getting it ready for that meeting um, in a quality, constructive format. That's uh, De Deputy Mayor Buxton. This year's sec this year, second or third time. Thank you for your deference. I uh, and I also my opinion is I, I would say whether I would be on the ad hoc committee or not. I would definitely want the input of every single council member, and and if I were not, I would want my input to be considered. And but also my view of an ad hoc committee is administrative in mostly administrative like to gather information organize it and for me uh, put everybody's input into a draft so I I would view the ad hoc committee um, more administratively than final decision making thank you absolutely I, I had councilmember Oxiger that I'd passed by by accident my apologies sir thank you mr. mayor so by ad hoc committee, how many members are you talking about? Would be three members. Three members. Um, 
and and all council members could lobby to the mayor for the choice. Okay. Uh, given that given this you know does affect all seven of us, I I would recommend that we do this as a committee of the whole. I would I would just say that this the purpose of this is administrative to get us ready to have that meeting in a constructive format where everybody's have input. So essentially the meetings that would occur in November and December would achieve it would essentially achieve that. Everybody's input would be there, but it would be formatted and ready for the discussion. Any any subsequent meetings before that, quite honestly, or I think would be a waste of time. Councilmember Harris, no. this is your second time, sir. So, um, you know, if it, since this is the deputy mayor's, um, uh, you know, proposal, I guess, um, uh, having done this for a little while now um, and kind of been a sap, um, I am going to recommend to my colleagues that uh, the deputy mayor prepare a written proposal with a specific process bring it back at the next meeting, and then we amend it uh, and pass that. Uh, we've had this history of doing this kind of ad hoc from the dais, and it's sloppy, and one person's understanding is this or that. You want a piece of paper with yep. this, Councilor that, Harris, is that a motion? Uh, <laughs> yes, it is indeed. Okay. Uh, the motion, yes. The is motion, there a second? The, the motion is to uh, have uh, Deputy Mayor Buxton prepare a formal proposal um, for the uh, rules update process. Bring it back next week for uh, amendment and uh, possible passage. Is there a second? I'll second it. Okay, Council Member Oxiger second it. Any discussion before we take a vote on the motion? Cou Council Member Pennington. So uh, this was part of my question from before, but I think it's it's uh, appropriate here. Um, I, the ad hoc committee or, or I, I guess the, uh, the, um, the, the consultant, um, I, I think in terms of you're, you're, you're wanting the, now we're asking the deputy mayor to, to put together a lot of documents and I think if I heard it right, the ad hoc committee would be doing all of that. Well, I don't know how much extra time everybody else has on this dais, but you know, th that's a tremendous amount of, of work and a tremendous amount of time. Um, my uh, thought would be that that you, when, if we hire this consultant, they take the lead on, on that work and putting that work together with the input from the council and the input that, that we provide them and provide through the, either their interviewing of council members, you know, um, and, and if we need a budget amendment to do this, I don't know where it comes out of, but I don't know that, that, that the deputy mayor, I, and this isn't an insult, this is, but I, I don't know that, that, that any one of us has particularly the, the scope or expertise to um, put that kind of proposal together and have it make some sort of, of a map. I think that, um, that you know, we vote on this, but I think that we come back and I think, um, I mean, I agree that we should have a consultant um, and maybe there's the mayor and the deputy mayor as a couple of point people as the, the council leadership, but I think that it, it and I agree with the council member Oscar that, that it should be the council as a whole and how we do that, I think, is really, um, is really important on the, the, the guise of, of the person that, that we hire to guide us through that on, on this expert person. So I, th I think we'll, we'll get to where we want to be, but I don't know that, that any one of us have that kind of expertise <clears throat> or you know, time. I made the motion because I have every confidence in the deputy mayor's ability to prepare a parliamentary procedure that is accurate and uh, would be for the good of the council. All right. So And on one page, by the way. So... Be, being that, uh, is there any further discussion before we um, vote on Council Member Harris's motion? Seeing none, all those that support that the motion that the Deputy Mayor come back with a detailed plan 
our assessment of the process for the council rule review. Uh, raise your right hand and say aye. I see two, I see council member Harris, I can't see council member Oxker. Those that oppose that motion, raise your right hand. I see council, council member Pennington, council member Steinmetz, deputy mayor Buxton, council member Nutting and myself. Vote, vote motion fails two five. With that, we're back on to the motion that, that council member um, Buck, our Deputy Mayor Buxton made that basically was Council Member Pennington's recommendation a motion. Well, so so hold on just a second because basically the motion that you have on the table that was friendly amended is that that an ad hoc committee be created, a consultant that staff will use staff for recommendations and costing and so forth be approved, over the next several months, there would be a process to collect all the feedback from all council members to incorporate it into a format to prepare it for a November, December discussion when we all have place. But this would allow us to capture those vehicles, et cetera. That is the motion. Now, we, everybody's had a discussion on it before the second motion is. I got a few people that didn't have a second. Is there any further discussion before we take a vote on the thing? Except council Member Harris, you've already had your two. <laughs> Uh, I would like to ask the council to uh, allow me a, uh, another chance to speak. With three council members, I will allow it. I, no, I see it. Go ahead, sir. You have one more time, one more pass. I, I volunteer to prepare such a draft proposal and bring it back for discussion next week. I think that that would make the, uh, basically it would make everything, you just need a piece of paper that's like one, two, three. You can react to it. You can say, this is good. I'd like to change that. But every time we've done these kinds of things, the ARPA, everything, it's always, it never turns out the way that you, you show up at the meeting and it's like. Council Member like, Harris, that what the, you're, you, you've made it, so, so this is a motion that you're saying that you propose that you come back with the written presentation on I, the July 14th meeting. I come back meeting. with a one page uh, proposal for the process of rules update at All right. the next do, meeting. Do I have a second? Seeing none, motion fails. Motion uh, doesn't even get to, to vote due to the lack of a second. With that, Councilmember Pennington, this would be your second time. So, um, I'd just like to uh, make sure that, or to have some clarity uh, it, with this motion. Uh, it, it is, does this include um, uh, the scope of work that, that the subject matter expert that we hire will do? Or is that to be determined and then um, Where's our financing come to, from? To be honest with you, I see that being determined in partnership with the consultant. I'm sure the city staff, from what I understand through our initial discussions, is reaching out, would reach out to a few of the qualified candidates, and they would be able to assess what the work would be. Yeah. They would probably give us some kind of costing. I'm going to pass over to city manager Matthias. Thank you. So there's a couple of different issues on the table, and we didn't bring up one of them relative to Councilmember Pennington that we had talked about and we've been in the process of trying to identify potential consultants who could assist the council in communications specifically. And the plan was that we would try to uh, come up with a consultant. <laughs> Somebody doesn't like what I'm saying. Um, and so at any rate, th this would be for the council. We anticipated and we talked about this with council that we would have this consultant spend potentially up to an hour per council member one-on-one, -on -one, get your thoughts about what a scope should look like, compile all those, come back to council and say, how do you want to proceed? That's, that's at one level relative to communication. As far as council rules go, I am absolutely committed that we play no role whatsoever in your deliberations or involvement or process in establishing those. We want no part of it. It's not appropriate for us to be involved, and I will uh, kind of hold that ground uh, to the degree I can, just so everyone's aware. So we are not the resource that's going to make this happen. And and nor should staff be involved. Our our as as a council, we should we can ask you for where the resources and then we'll bring you the invoice. Yeah. So sure. that's right. well, that's a so fire about what it is, that. right? <laughs> so so let's uh, so seeing I believe there's no longer any any more discussion. 
the motion is to create an ad hoc committee, uh, get a consultant through the process that the city manager just described, and target a November date to begin the process of council review by the city council. With that being said, I'm going, go, going to go ahead and take a vote. All those in favor of that process and that motion, raise your right hand. I see Councilmember Pennington, Councilmember Steinmetz, Deputy Mayor Buxton, Councilmember Nutting, Councilmember Oxiger, and myself. All those opposed? Councilmember Harris, the motion passes 6-1. Thank you, Council. Now, is there, with that, is there any new business? And before I get into that, I, like, I want to read my verbiage here. We'll move on to the new business. This is the time for the sole purpose of proposing new business items that have not previously been before the council for discussion on a future agenda. This is not a time for questions about old business. Council members can submit questions or seek updates on previously discussed business to the city manager at any time. Do any council members have new business they would like to propose? Seeing none, we will move on to board and committee reports. With that, I turn the floor to council member Pennington. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, first off, thanks to everyone that showed up this evening and, and gave your comments. I appreciate that. Appreciate being involved in, in your local government. That's important. Um, con again, congratulations to Assistant Chief uh, Richards. Congratulations, and thank you, Dan, for your years of service. Fifteen years is, is uh, you're halfway there. So anyway, <laughs> so thank you. Thank you, Dan. Um, and I attended the uh, public safety and emergency management meeting this, meet this evening, but I'll defer to uh, Deputy Mayor Buxton for that report. That's it. All right. Thank you. Moving on to Council Member Steinmetz. Oh, thank you. Um, I just want to say that I, I was at the uh, fireworks and all the activity that was going on at the marina uh, on Saturday. It was fabulous. Uh, I don't know how many people were there. The guessing is probably somewhere between four and 5,000. Um, but, you know, it, it was really a well-attended event. It was a well-behaved event. We had a great time. The quarter deck had some wonderful music in the afternoon. I got way too much sun, uh, you know, and then I saw a bunch of great fireworks out there. So, really, I think we, we, we pulled off a very spectacular event. And I'd like to thank Destination Des Moines for putting on a wonderful fireworks show. Um, you know, I think that was really, really fantastic. Um, uh, I've been down at the farmer's market, uh, you know, a uh, couple of times. There has been, at least from my viewpoint, no drop off in uh, attendance, or at least not a visible one. And that's fantastic. Um, my mother has now told me that anytime I'm going down there, she wants to go with me. <laughs> so, <clears throat> um, I took her down last Saturday and she had a great time. Uh, I attended the uh, uh, public safety and emergency management meeting. Um, again, congratulations to uh, uh, Assistant Chief Richards uh, on her promotion. Uh, we had some really good discussions. Things have seemed to have gone well. Uh, and so, the, the summer events are starting to roll. We had a good, uh, although I wasn't able to attend, good music in the park uh, last night. This coming weekend, uh, we have the Little League Girls Softball Regional Tournament uh, happening up at Stephen J. Underwood Park. Uh, that has all been worked out and apparently is just ready to go. Uh, so, uh, you know, there are a lot of things happening in the city, and I think that's just, that's just great. So, thank you. That's all I have to report. Thank you. Moving on to Councilmember Oxiger. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I would just reiterate what I said last time is that um, I went on the websites today of Burien, SeaTac, uh, Tukwila, Normandy Park, Federway, and then us, and we're the only one that does not have listed uh, our uh, committees and opportunities for the public to become involved and uh, information both with what the committees are, uh, what the current makeup is, and what any vacancies are. And I would really like to see that because it encourages involvement by the, the uh, by citizens of uh, our city. And there are also great opportunities for people to get their feet wet in case they might want to 
participate uh, more directly, i.e. the council. So, thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Oxiger. Moving on to Councilmember Nutty. Thank you, Mayor. Um, again, congratulations to Assistant Chief Richards and to Dan for all you've done for your last 15 years. Um, I attended the um, Des Moines Arts Commission Summer Concert Series uh, last night. Uh, it was good, good music. Um, weather held out. I didn't get to stay the whole time, but uh, it was good. Um, <clears throat> And they'll be having that, <clears throat> excuse me, um, July 13th, July 20th, and July 27th, and August 3rd uh, down at the Beach Park um, at 7 on those days. Uh, National Night Out will be August 2nd. Uh, that's a Tuesday. You can sign up your neighborhood and um, officers possibly or uh, the fire department will swing by. Um, if they're not having too busy of a night, and you can go to the city's website um, to department, police, and N, excuse me, NNO2022, National Night Out 2022, um, to register your neighborhood. Um, the girls, my girls are doing their lemonade uh, stand fundraiser again on August 16th um, for Shop with a Cop, and the Des Moines Police Foundation plans to host that event. And then um, I missed the farmer's market this week. I was on vacation, but uh, have been down there every week since it's opened. And um, they all be running the farmer's market on Saturdays, 10 to 2, um, until the 24th. Um, and I think that concludes my remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Nutting. Moving on to Councilmember Harris. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so uh, I've been uh, volunteering a little bit with uh, group called the Living Road of Remembrance, and um, this used to be a big deal. They uh, planted a number of elm trees and created a, uh, <clears throat> a, a memorial to World War I along Des Moines Memorial Drive uh, many years ago, and um, it's, um, it's, you know, a key component of our history, uh, and uh, there's an opportunity for them now with SR 509 to create um, basically to uh, build it out more and um, also uh, see as that the road comes into <laughs> into focus there's Hillgrove Cemetery which is a uh, wonderful place that needs to be preserved um, you it for people who are interested in genealogy you can go to these different, um, I believe it's called Grave Finder and so on, and m most of the uh, <laughs> people at the cemetery, the graves, they have a, a, a biography where you can see uh, people going back to 1850 who founded the uh, area and, um, you know, and how their descendants uh, basically uh, made what we have today. And somehow, the forests in that area and the trails and the living road of remembrance. It's all something that can be used to um, uplift the entire area. Um, and so they're getting their website back together and trying to get some word out. Um, I attended a, uh, I met with a couple of the commissioners of the Port of Seattle and uh, um, Apparently, we're having some um, disputes about our own email policy here um, and uh, also disability policy here. So one of the rules updates would be how do council members um, fit in as employees? What rights do we have? And um, because that's something that just got taken for granted. Um, more on that later. The uh, I uh, attended the King County uh, Flood Control today, and um, they are a fabulous group, but they are sort of focused more on the north. They're more biased towards um, the projects in their parts of the world, and uh, so it's it, it's good for me to be a bit of that. Um, I just want to uh, the people who left. Um, I've seen many people since you know since I've been here, 
and basically people are just angry as hell about this, that, and the other thing, and then they come here and they give their public comment and they just fold. They just go, oh, I wish you could, and they will just go on for a half an hour, every curse man sailor language. And, um, you know, <laughs> that's why at a certain point, um, you, you just, you have to express your frustration. At a certain point, you become complicit in not improving the, whatever problem you've got. Um, because if you're too polite, I'm sorry, but, um, you know, you're too polite. And um, regarding the rules, um, I voted against it because um, we have all the rules we need. Uh, we just don't follow them. We simply don't follow them. And uh, you have to have a culture, I guess they call it a code of honor in the military, where you obey the rules. And when you see people not obeying the rules, you uh, object. And we don't. Yep. And that's why Des Moines is as it is. Thank you. Thank you. Deputy Mayor Buxton. Thank you, Mayor. So I uh, chaired the Public Safety and Emergency Management Committee this afternoon. And we received a body camera update. So right now they're in the middle of a software transition and some training, uh, coordinating the body cameras and vehicle cameras. And they're waiting for a final process with the police guild before final implementation. So looking forward to getting that on the road. Pardon the pun. Uh, summer events have been covered well by my colleagues. Uh, I think the only thing that wasn't mentioned is we are going to be having some movies in the park. And I think uh, we can look at, uh, go to the website, um, Parks, Des Moines Parks. Where would we go to look for where the movies in the park? Does somebody know? They're, on, they're on the Facebook page, but I did just put them on the city's calendar as well. Okay, great. So that's where you can find that. I'm excited about the movies in the in the parks. Uh, the parade is moving forward. I think I might, since that's uh, the mayor's wheelhouse, I'll let him uh, report on that. Uh, that was it. We, we did talk a little bit about it in public safety, however. Um, also, in public safety, we had a conversation about the regulation of short-term rentals in order to increase safety in our neighborhoods, and that conversation is going to be ongoing. We're gathering information right now. Uh, I, as um, then, in regard to community events, I enjoyed the music uh, in the park last night as well with uh, I, the, the Council Member Nutting, Council Member Steinmetz, and... Uh, Appreciated being, I appreciate these the efforts to bring some of these uh, things into our community, gathering spots, points of interest, the arts. It is really an amazing thing to be able to bring the community out again together and enjoy these things together. So I'm enjoying my summer. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Mayor Buxton. Um, City of Andrew Mathias, I just want to thank you and your staff for a wonderful fire fireworks event. The new Soundview Park was a huge hit. Um, a particular individual in the community, David Rosen, took some shots showing that park and how many people enjoyed it and so forth. From what I could hear, it was like the best place to be. It was the hottest ticket. And I was down on the marina and I didn't think my seats were too bad. So I just want to congratulate. It was well run. I thought security was done excellent and so forth. And I'll thank Destination Des Moines, for, for Moines also for providing the fireworks. Great collaborative effort, and I appreciate it, particularly Ashley Young, who did a fantastic job. And the guy that never likes to get recognized in the back, Mr. Wilkins, you did an excellent job, and so was your staff. Well prepared, the fences, the security. And last but not least, the police did an amazing job. Um, I really didn't hear about huge issues or significance. It seemed like the crowd was was happy, glad to be there, and it was great to see the diverse community together. Um, as, as far as the parade, which will be July 23rd, a um, little bit of planning. The great thing is is that, uh, that uh, Assistant Chief um, Richards was there with the parade committee, um, some great plans. There are about 35 entries, but the exciting thing is, is uh, with the entries, they didn't realize we had 
we, we have a pretty good parade and it's, and it's growing very rapidly. So for our community, again, it should be a great gather, gathering point. That's gonna be July 23rd. Council, I will be reaching out to each of you to make sure if you're gonna attend or not uh, so we can make sure we have accommodations and vehicles and so forth and uh, refer you to the parade um, committee in some details. Um, you're absolutely right. July 9th, we will be doing the Washington State Little League softball tournament at Stephen J. Underwood. I've been asked to throw out the first pitch. I've been practicing my underhand so I don't embarrass myself. Um, and I'm a little uh, little concerned I might throw it over the backstop. So anyway, uh, but uh, this is the 12-year-old uh, 12, 12 uh, girls state championship, highly competitive, and it's exciting that we get to, uh, we get to use our parks, and I thank Michael and your team for the cooperation to be able to make this event happen because uh, it's a great chance for these young women to uh, be able to uh, understand what competition and teamwork and some of the life skills they need. Uh, I will also make a comment about the council rules. We need the rule changes. There's things like social media that need to be adjusted. There needs to be clarifications of the use of city email and whether you have the authorization or designation to contact outside you know, entities and governances and so forth without the designation of council. We also need some um, guidelines if, so, if that happens, what do we do as a council? It, it's not been a secret in this council that we've had problems with that and they need to be addressed. Also, the council rules aren't relevant to today. Like I said, mentioned before, social media and a couple other things. This is a good process that needs to happen. And what we're doing here is gonna be the, is gonna be the rules that will lead us into the future. The hard things are not easy. And in this case, this will not be an easy thing. It'll be contentious. I tell everybody now, most of the contentiousness will be in the November, December window. But it's a necessary thing that needs to happen. With that being said, it is, he, Council Member Harris was right. Everybody needs to follow the rules. That's the problem. We have an issue here and it needs to be addressed. And that's what this process will do. With that being said, do I have a motion to adjourn? Move. I have Council Member Nutting. I have a second from Council Member uh, Steinmetz. The third, before I go to the vote, the, the next meeting will be Thursday, July 14th at 6 p.m. Um, with that, um, all those in favor of adjourning this meeting, raise your right hand. I see the vote passes 7-0. Have a good weekend. Be safe, everybody.